My name is Brian Getson, and I am an immigration lawyer, and I'm based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but immigration is federal law, so we represent clients all over the United States, and I specialize in obtaining green cards for scientific researchers. I'm a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and I've been practicing now for 25 years, and I've authored a book on obtaining a U.S. visa based on achievement. So there's only one way to start talking about immigration in uh, September of 2020, and that is with the, the, the president. And, you know, there's obviously been a lot going on in the last few months. There's been a lot of uh, rumors out there for things that, you know, people were afraid of happening that never actually happened. So I just want everybody to know that the immigration service is still open for business and they are still approving cases. And, you know, unless something actually changes, you can't base your status and your decision making on hypothetical things because there's always talk and a lot of it is political. So, you know, our our kind of motto is that, you know, uh, scientists are still welcome to the United States in 2020 and cases are still being approved. So what has changed is there were two executive orders that the president uh, initiated. And the first one was in April of 2020. And what that executive order did was it, it suspended all immigrant visas at U.S. embassies overseas for 60 days. You could still apply for a green card in the United States, and there were certain exceptions to that order. Then in June of 2020, the executive order was updated to be more broad. And this is the existing executive order that we're operating under right now. So essentially what that order says is that immigrant visas overseas are suspended until the end of the year. So in other words, you can't apply for a green card at a U.S. embassy overseas unless there's an exception until the end of the year. Then likewise, all H-1B and L-1 visas are also suspended until the end of the year. There are certain exceptions for that as well, which are national interest waiver exceptions. Then J visas are also suspended until the end of the year, but this does not affect research. So researcher based J visas are still being uh, granted at US embassies overseas. And the main thing to understand about this executive order is that if you were physically present in the United States on the date of the order, in other words, your body was in the United States in June of 2020 when Trump issued this order, then it does not apply to you at all. So it doesn't apply to your ability to change your status from within the United States. It doesn't apply uh, to your ability to apply for a green card from within the United States. And it also doesn't affect your ability to obtain an H or an L visa overseas. So in other words, if you were in the United States, then you could still leave the United States and apply for an H or an L visa. Now, outside of these executive orders, you know, COVID has wreaked havoc on the uh, processing of visas outside of the United States. So at this point in time, the embassies are slowly beginning to reopen and have visa interview appointments. And if you would need one, it would be on a case by case basis where you'd have to reach out to the embassy and email them and you know, figure out if th there's a visa appointment available. And then there's still also certain COVID bans on certain parts of the world where if you're in a certain country within the past 14 days, you can't come to the United States. And those are, the Schnegan European countries and Brazil and China. So, you know, there's a lot going on in terms of uh, COVID, but the executive orders themselves, the really the point that I wanna make is that if you're already in the United States, nothing applies to you. It's business as usual. Immigration is accepting 
petitions and applications, they're open, they are approving cases. So the exceptions to these immigrant visa bans are if you're for spouses and children of US citizens, and again, if your work is in the national interest research or work related to COVID or the food supply or something that, that's in the national interest. So, you know, this is really what it boils down to. There were a lot of rumors over the summer that they were going to take away OPT. They were going to, you know, make the, the, the waiting times different for the rest of the world compared to India and China. And, you know, there were a lot of just sort of things that were floating out there. We were going to, there was going to be an executive order about a merit-based system. So all of those uh, rumors never came to fruition. So the only thing we're really dealing with right now is this June executive order that bans immigrant visas, H and L visas with exceptions. And again, it doesn't apply to people in the United States. So that sort of clears up where we stand right now from you know, a political perspective in terms of what's going on. So again, you can change your status to H-1B or L-1 from within the United States. You can still apply for a green card from within the United States. But if you're outside the US, you have to, and you're, you're coming to the US in a postdoc job, you're gonna need to do that in J1 unless you can get a waiver for one of the H1Bs and that's something you would need to talk to the university about. So now, in terms of navigating your immigration status from the sort of the, the temporary non-immigrant status to the time of the green card, it's very important to have a plan and to sort of know where you are right now and know where you're headed in the future and to also have a plan B in case plan A doesn't work out. So if you're in the United States, you're either here as an F1 student, you're here in H1B, you're here in J1, or you might be here in O1. So those are the categories in which you're here wor working. And you're either working in a postdoc job or in industry. And you know, the majority of you are likely in F1 status right now, maybe in your OPT. So you need to think about how you're going to maintain your underlying non-immigrant status at all times. And you should take whatever job you want to take, whether that's in postdoc or industry, and let the immigration follow. But there's different paths forward, depending on whether you're in postdoc or in industry. So after you graduate your F1 and you have OPT, it's good for three years. It's 12 months initially, and then a 24 month STEM extension. Then the option, you have to think about how are you going to maintain your status at the end of that three years of OPT. And the options are a little bit different if you're in a postdoc than you're if you're in industry. So if you're in a postdoc, H-1Bs are cap exempt. So a postdoc could, a university could apply for you for H-1B status without any kind of limitation. A university could also put you into J-1 status. And if you're not from China or India, and there's no wait to apply for a green card, then you could think about applying for a green card during your OPT if you're qualified. So if you're in industry, at the end of your OPT, you have to have H-1B, but that is subject to a lottery where USCIS runs a lottery every March and you have to be able to win the lottery and have your case approved in order to stay in H-1 status in industry. Or you have to apply for an O-1 visa, which is the non-immigrant equivalent of extraordinary ability alien. And the alternative, again, if you're not from China or India, maybe you can get a green card during that OPT. So when you're applying for jobs, it's a good idea to have a conversation about being sponsored for status at the end of your OPT or even beforehand. So you should have conversations during the interview process in terms of, is the university gonna sponsor you? Are they willing to do H or J? If you're going to industry, 
is the industry job going to sponsor you for H-1B in the lottery? If they're not, then maybe that's not the best job for you unless you absolutely need it in order to avoid unemployment because you're only allowed 90 days of total unemployment in OPT for the first 12 months and 150 uh, total during the STEM extension. So again, OPT is good for three years. You can apply for a green card during OPT. So applying for a green card is a two-part process. There's the I-140 petition, which is the EB1A Extraordinary Ability, EB1B Outstanding Professor Researcher, and NIW. And then there's the I-485 green card application. So you can apply for the I-140 at any time, but you can only apply for the I-485 if you have a current priority date. And the dates are backlogged for India and China, which I'm gonna talk about, and the rest of the world, they're not backlogged. So the rest of the world applying for a green card during OPT is an option, but F1 is what's known as a non-immigrant intent visa, meaning if you file the 485, you cannot get a STEM extension. So, uh, that's not the case with the I-140. If you just file the I-140, you can still get your STEM OPT EAD. So because of this non-immigrant intent nature of F1, we usually file the I-140 first by itself. And then if you're not from China or India, we file the 485 only if and when the I-140 is approved. So again, this is about thinking how you're going to maintain your status at the end of your OPT. So H-1B is another option. Again, if you're in a university setting, it's cap exempt, there's no issues with changing to H-1B. If you're in an industry setting, you have to go through the visa lottery. So the odds of winning the visa lottery are one or three in worse or worse. So the lottery system changed this year, this past March. It used to be that you had to submit a complete H-1B filing to the immigration service. Then they would accept all of the filings. They would run the lottery. And if the case was not selected, the complete filing would be returned. That was expensive because the employers had to pay lawyers to do the complete filing. The lottery system changed this year where now you just register online and it takes about 10 minutes to complete and you just put in basic information. And then if your case is selected, then you submit the petition. So it became much easier for employers to sponsor uh, people for H-1B in the lottery because it was a lot less work involved to do that and a lot less expensive. So because of that, the numbers went up this year. There are 85,000 total H-1B visas, and there's 65,000 regular visas, and 20,000 for those with U.S. master's degrees or higher, which is, you know, basically those of you that are listening right now. And there were about 275,000 applications this year for the 85,000 slots. And then there, in, in past years, there had been around 200,000. So you could see the increase, but you know, with COVID, not everybody went forward. So they actually ran a second lottery in August because not all of the 85,000 had been filed with the first lottery. So one good tip is that if you are going to industry, you want to file for the H-1B lottery every year of your OPT, even if it means cutting your OPT short. A mistake I see people make sometimes is they wait until their third year of OPT to file in the lottery and you've lost two chances in the lottery by doing that. So again, talk with your employers, have an open line of communication about sponsorship. When you're in the university setting, H-1B is better for you than J-1 because it's a dual intent visa. So I had talked about F1 being a non-immigrant intent visa. J1 is also that, but H1B is dual intent. So that means there's no problems with traveling or extending your H1 status when you file for the green card. 
And you can also, for those of you from China or India that might be stuck in a backlog, you can extend your H beyond six years if needed. So you don't want to have J1 unless you have no choice because of this dual intent. And there's also something called a two-year home residency requirement, where what that means is if you're subject to this, you cannot get an H-1B visa or a green card unless you go back to your home country for two years or obtain a waiver. So most university postdocs like to use the J-1 because they can pay you less. And if you have no choice but to take the J-1 to stay, then you take it and you then work out the two-year uh, waiver later on. But again, have conversations about maybe sponsoring you for H instead of J. So the O-1, you're really only going to use this for industry because in the university, you would have the H or the J option. So if you don't win the H-1B lottery, then you can uh, join a company uh, through the O-1 if you're qualified. It's a high level, but you have to think about it. And also, if you're subject to the J-1 two-year residency rule, you can still hold O-1. If you can't extend your H beyond six years, you can hold O-1. And O-1 is used by many people when they want to transition from a postdoc job to an industry job, and you can't do that through the H-1B lottery. You can do it through an O-1. So, that was talking about maintaining your underlying non-immigrant status. And again, you always want to be thinking ahead. How are you going to be able to keep living and working in the United States when your existing status expires? And have a plan for that. Have a backup plan just in case you don't win the lottery. Because you know, if you're in an industry job and you never win the lottery and you're not qualified for 01, then the only way for you to stay here if you're not getting a green card is to go back and take a postdoc job. So now we're talking about next pass to a green card. So the normal way that foreign nationals are sponsored for a green card is through what's called a labor certification. And that's where you have to have an employer sponsor you and the employer has to do advertising in the newspaper and by other means. And they have to demonstrate a lack of US worker availability. That process had gotten harder with the level of unemployment in the United States. So all of you want to try and avoid that labor certification and file for a green card based on your research accomplishment and not worrying about US workers. And there's three categories where you can do that. There's the EB1A extraordinary ability where you can self file there's the EB1B Outstanding Professors and Researchers, where you have to have a university or a company sponsor you. And then there's the EB2 National Interest Waiver, and that is can be self-filed. So there are strategies that are applied in terms of deciding when is the best time to apply for a green card. And you want to have a roadmap and you want to always have a backup plan. So when I am analyzing somebody's status in order to figure out when is the best time they're applying for the green card, these are kind of the factors that I'm taking into consideration. It's when does your current status expire and are you able to extend your current status or change your status? In other words, is there a way for you to stay in the United States without having to file for the green card. Are you in an industry job or in a postdoc job? If you're in a postdoc job where you're continuing to publish and present, the timing might be different than if you're in, in an industry job where you're not going to be publishing anymore. And in that case, you might want to speed up the filing. The most important consideration is how strong is your case now? And is it going to improve in the future? So I'm looking at your citation level, above and beyond everything else. We're looking at your publication level, your uh, conference presentations, whether your work is being practically used. We're looking at your qualifications, which we're going to talk about soon. And we're making that analysis. And then are there any family or job considerations? Are you living apart from your spouse and you need the green card to live together? Do you need a green card to have a certain type of job? 
And then also, what country are you from? Because again, there is a backlog from people for China and India. So now we want to talk about getting a green card based on your research accomplishments to avoid this labor certification. So I keep talking about the difference between China and India and everybody else, and this is why. There is a limit on the number of green cards that are issued each year, and no one country can have more than 28% of the total green cards. So there, the highest demand comes from China and India. So there are waits for China and India. And the waiting times are uh, issued each month in what's called the Visa Bulletin. And if you Google Visa Bulletin, you'll be able to see that. So the September 2020 Visa Bulletin, there's a uh, final action chart and then there's a date for filing chart. So, you know, we're right now, immigration is using the final action date chart. So that's what I have up here right now. Sometimes they use the dates for filing chart, but for the past several months, they've been using the final action date chart. Date for filing chart, if they use it, it means you can file for the 485 earlier than they can approve it. So if you look at the visa bulletin right now, you see that for the world, it's current in both categories, both the EB1, which again is extraordinary ability and outstanding professor and researcher, and for NIW. For China the, and India, the wait in EB1 is the same. It's two and a half years from the time you file the I-140 EB1 or you know, have a priority date of an I-140 until you can file the 485. Now, when you go to NIW, there's a big difference between India and China. You know, India is back to July 2009, and that really doesn't move forward very much, and China is back to January 2016. So, if I am from the world, NIW is easier than EB-1. So, if both are current and there's no way if you're from the world, you really only want to consider filing NIW. There's a misconception that premium processing can get you the green card faster from the world because you know, you, you're going to get the I-140 approved, but you can, if you're able to concurrently file the 45 with the NIW, you're going to get the green card the same time or even faster than if you use EB-1. And, you know, immigration was interviewing people for 485. They've been waiving that in some instances during COVID. But the, the processing time is the same for the 485. So if you're from the world, it really, really makes sense, absent very unusual circumstances, to only consider filing an NIW. Now, if you're from China or India, then you're looking at a faster wait in EB-1 than NIW. For China, it's not that much different. For India, it's a big difference. So we want to try and get you into EB-1, but we have to think about the best way to go about doing that. So if you're from China or India, you have to think about whether you want to file an EB-1 at the same time as an NIW. That's one strategy. Or you have to think about the priority date substitution strategy. And what that means is if you would file an NIW petition first, and if that gets approved, you own the priority date. And then you would file the EB-1 petition in about two and a half years when the priority date of the NIW is close to being current. And then you could substitute the priority date of the NIW into the EB-1. And then if the EB-1 is approved, file the green card without waiting. So you're not getting the green card any faster whether you file the EB-1 now at the same time as the NIW or whether you file it in two and a half years. But by waiting two and a half years, you're giving yourself a much higher chance for approval. So it's hard for people to wrap their head around this. But, you know, let's look at the example. So you're from China and India and you're on OPT with 175 sites and no significant positive factors. 
due to the visa bulletin, you can't file an I-140-485 concurrently, and you're unlikely to win an EB-1. You're unlikely to win an EB-1 because you only have 175 sites, which is very low for an EB-1. And you're also early on in your career where you're having to show you're at the top of the field in the world, but you, you're still in your OPT. So what you could do is, again, you file your EB-1 when the priority date of the NIW is near current after strengthening your case. The odds of the EB-1 are higher because your case is stronger and established in an earlier priority date with the NIW, and you're getting your green card at the same time. So let's say you filed your NIW in September of 2020, and it gets approved. Then you own that September of 2020 priority date. Then in March of 2023, when that September 2020 priority date of the NIW would be current, in the EB-1 category, then you would file the EB-1 and it's as if you're filing the EB-1 in September 2020 because you can substitute the priority date. Now, if you have a strong EB-1 case, okay, you're in H-1B status, you're in your third year, you have 800 citations, you have done a lot of peer review, then in that case, I'm going to file the EB-1 at the same time as the NIW, and I'm also going to file the uh, I'm going to file the NIW also because it serves as insurance in case the EB-1 is denied. So you know you never know anything with immigration, so you always want to have good strategy and good timing. And even if you're filing an EB-1 case, also file an NIW at the same time as a backup. And again, if you are not from China or India, I cannot stress enough that there's no reason to file an EB-1 as an NIW has, you know, essentially the less wait time or the same, and it's easier leaps and bounds to get an NIW approved than an EB-1. So now, how do we win an EB-1 NIW case? What are the credentials that we have to show? So. Number one is if you have a receipt of a major internationally recognized prize or award like the Nobel Prize, you'll get a green card. And my comment is good luck with this method because I don't expect any of you have the Nobel Prize and I've never had a client who has had the Nobel Prize. So for everybody else, with EB1A, there's a list of 10 categories and you need to meet three. For EB1B, there's a list of eight categories and you need to meet two. And for NIW, there's no categories. You can make the case however you would like, but we tend to follow along with the EB1 category. So the first type of evidence we're looking for is receipt of a national or international recognized award in the field. This is a difficult category. Not many of my clients have this. It's, a, it's an award, again, that's on a national or international level, and it has to be open to all researchers at any career stage. It's not a postdoc award, an early career award. It's not a conference travel award. What you don't want to do is try and make a category where you know you don't qualify. In other words, don't give immigration your early career fellowship award when you know that's not going to qualify. But this is something where you can control it. So if there's an award out there that qualifies, you know, you might as well apply for it. You, the worst thing that happens is you don't get it. So, you know, this is really more important for people from China and India for EB1. It's not so important for NIW. Next is achievement-based membership in association. So, you know, anybody can join ASCB by paying dues. So that doesn't count. What counts is, you know, the extreme example is the National Academy of Sciences or the Royal Society of London. Those are achievement-based memberships. There are certainly things in between, and you should look at your field. You should see if there's any organizations that you can apply to join where you have to be let in, voted in based on your accomplishments. And again, this is more important for EB1 than it is for NIW. 
Next is publish material about you and your work in journals or other major media platforms. So this is other people writing about your work. Is there a press release about your work? Has your work been discussed in an editorial comment in a journal or really talked about in depth in a book chapter? The material has to discuss your name in it and your work. So it can't just be a site to a paper. It has to have your name in the text. You know, it can also have your PI's name. So again, this is something you can control. Universities all have press release offices and you can ask them to do a, a, a press release about one of your publications and to put your name in it. You can just see if they can uh, put you in touch with a journalist to write about you. So having other people write about your work is helpful to a green card case. Now, the three most common categories for EB1 and also you know, what's very helpful for NIW, the first is judging the work of others. So this is doing peer review for journals in your own name, not doing it for your PI. The journal has to ask you directly. So reach out to the journal, email them, call them. You know, if we ever have in-person conferences again, you know, which hopefully will be soon, then, you know, the, the journals have exhibit booths at conferences. Go talk to them. Ask your PI for help. Do as many peer review as you can. Five is better than three, 10 is better than five, and so on. The level of the journal doesn't matter so much. Quantity matters more than quality. And that's kind of a theme through immigration. The more you have, the better. Next is original contributions of major significance. So this is objective evidence, including citation level and reference letters. So again, when we make a case, whether it's EB1A, EB1B, or NIW, we're giving immigration evidence and we're giving them letters. So in terms of the evidence, we give the Google Scholar citation page. We also give uh, the first page of the publication. And it's important to know that there's case law that says that even if you're not the first author on a publication, you can still consider that research as your own. So your letters should talk about all of your publications, even if you're not first author. We give evidence of your conference presentation. We give evidence of the about 20 to 25 articles that have cited your work, highlighting the citation to your work. If there's any interest in your work, if people have emailed you or reached out to you on LinkedIn or ResearchGate for your expertise or your papers, I like to give that to immigration. It helps to establish you as an expert in the field if in the normal course people are reaching out to you. Then if you have any patents, any grants, then you know, we would give uh, copies of that. And likewise, you know, the, the media articles. So in terms of letters, letters are far and away the most important part of the case. And I like to give three different kinds of letters. The first kind is what I call independent reference letters. And independent means the author has never worked or gone to school where you have worked or gone to school. They're not a co-author and they're not a collaborator. Maybe you met them at a conference or they cited you or it's your PI's friend, but it's better if they have some pre-existing knowledge of your work. I like to have five of these letters total maybe three from in the US and two from outside or the other way around. And I like to have these letters provide a career overview. In other words, the five letters talk about all of your publicly available research accomplishments. I find that to be more effective than having one author talk about one project, a second author talk about a second project, et cetera. So these letters, could be a few pages long if you have a lot of accomplishments. And that's the point. The point is to show immigration in detail what you've accomplished, why it's important, what is the practical significance, and how has it been recognized. The second kind of letter is from your supervisors. We know your supervisors are going to say nice things about you because they work with you every day but we still wanna have a letter from them and the supervisor letters only talk about the work done under their supervision. 
The third set of letters, which is what really sets my law firm apart from other law firms, is that we take the time to write what I call supplemental letters. And these are short letters that are talking about the significance of your research. Is there a private company that is interested in or using your research? Have them write a letter. What about a government agency? If a government agency writes a letter for you, that carries a lot of weight with the immigration service, which is also a government agency. People that have cited you, why did they cite you? How did they use your work to help their own? If you've had a collaboration, then you know how did your work benefit the collaboration? If you've uh, given an oral conference presentation, then you know why were you selected to give the oral conference presentation? Likewise, why were you selected to do peer review for a journal? If you're, you received a grant, why were you given the grant? If your patent's commercialized, have who is ever using it talk about it or the patent office. So these little two-page letters really go a long way in a case. So my law firm, we write the letters for you. So the way our process works is you would outline your research for us based on samples that I give you. Then we have a team of science writers who all have bachelor's or master's degrees in science related fields, and they assist in writing the letters. And after you outline your research, we ask questions to make the research more simple and understandable because your audience here is an immigration officer. So the letters can't read like journal articles. The immigration officer who's deciding your fate with a green card doesn't understand science. So you have to make it simple. And then we would write the letters and send them to you to edit. And once they're edited, you would forward them to the authors and we give sample emails to send to the authors to help uh, get them to write letters. So again, our letters are effective because independent letters, we discuss all the research, we have these supplemental letters. We also avoid problematic language. You know, a lot of times when people do this themselves or they use lawyers that are not experienced, they provide letters to the immigration service that the immigration service then uses to deny a case. For example, you should never talk about the potential of your research in a letter. Something that has the potential to cure cancer also has the potential to not cure cancer. So immigration is only judging you on your past accomplishments. So you want to avoid speculative future looking language. You don't want to talk about working as a team because you know there, there's law that says that you know, you can claim research as your own, and I talked about that. So again, you know, having experience in writing these letters and, and writing them properly is very important. So the next category is authorship of journal articles in the field. And again, this is something everybody has, and you're gonna, the, the, the impact level of the journal isn't as important as just how many publications you have. And again, the higher level of publications, the higher level of citation. And, you know, I, I talked a little bit about citation. It's the most important thing. And how many sites do you need to get your case approved? There's no answer to that question. You know, our law firm, we're one of a few in the United States to offer a money back guarantee if the, uh, on the attorney's fee if the case is not approved. And we usually base that on citation level. I like to see 75 to 100 sites for a money back guarantee on an NIW. With EB1A, it's really hard to get an EB1A approved with less than 300 citations. And I've seen immigration deny EB1s at all level of citation. I've seen them deny at, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 700. I've also seen them approve at lower levels. So again, it's a matter of making a decision if you're from China or India about whether you're gonna file the EB1 and the NIW at the same time, or have that substitution of the NIW first and the EB1 later. And citation level really dictates that more than anything else. And, you know, we give free consultations year round. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to talk to anybody uh, individually about the strategy for their case. So 
The next category is display of work at showcases. This doesn't really count for researchers. Then playing a leading or critical role for organizations with a distinguished reputation. Again, this is only gonna be for EB1 and it's very hard. Leading role is based on title. Critical role is showing that your work is critical to the outcome of the entire organization. High salary compared to others. Unfortunately, this is not really the case for research. And likewise, commercial success. So the EB1A legal standard is showing you're among the small percentage at the very top of the field in the world. You have to have sustained national or international acclaim. You need to meet three of the categories that we talked about. But even if you meet three categories, immigration is still going to analyze your case and determine whether by what's called a preponderance of the evidence, they feel you meet this high standard. And that preponderance of the evidence test is called the Kazarian standard. EB1B is you have to show international recognition as outstanding. You have to have a tenure or tenure track teaching position or a permanent research position, which is above a postdoc. And you have to have at least three years of teaching or research experience in the field. And again, it's the same Kazarian standard where if you meet two categories, you could still be denied. The uh, EB1B can be with a, a university or an employer. If it's with an employer, there has to be at least three other full-time researchers in your department or division. The problem is it belongs to the employer and not you. So if you're from India or China and you're filing an EB1B, you're looking at a two and a half year wait until you can file the 485 and then another uh, six months until you could change jobs without having to start the EB1B over. So, you know, you, you have to be committed to the employer if you're from India or China for three years. And that's why the substitution strategy works well if you're going to do a future EB1B because then you can just file the green card right away without waiting if the case is approved. So the national interest waiver, you have to have an advanced degree, which all of you do. You have to demonstrate your employment in the national interest. And the legal standard for this is called matter of Danisar. And you have to show your work is of substantial merit and national importance. For all of you, that's the case. You're gonna be benefiting healthcare, the environment, the economy, whatever it may be. You have to be well positioned to advance the proposed endeavor and, you know, Usually you have to have some sort of job or plans for work in the United States. I prefer to file these after you're already working in the United States. In other words, after you graduate your PhD and start your OPT, or if you're overseas, it's better to come in the US first and apply after you're here in H or J or O status. And, uh, but you can apply from overseas if you have some sort of intent to employ letter from a prospective employer. And then you have to show thirdly that on balance, we're gonna look at your credentials and not care about US workers, that you've influenced the field to such an extent with your research that you're going to uh, not care about US workers because of the work you're doing. And again, NIW is much, much easier than EB1A or EB1B. There's something called premium processing. It's not available for NIW, only for EB1A, EB1B. Uh, they say the decision is 15 days or less, but there's a much higher incident of requests for evidence and denial with premium processing. If you're from China or India and you have to wait two and a half years anyway to file for the green card, there's really no point in doing premium processing. So I really recommend against it, again, absent some kind of unusual circumstance. You have to define your field of research in these cases, and you are free to define it however you would like. You have to say you're a researcher in the field of blank, and you fill in the blank. So you have to be strategic about this field. It has to be broad enough to cover all of your research. It has to cover your PhD and your postdoc, all of your publications. So if you sort of change the direction of your research, you have to try and find a common field that uh, covers everything. It can't be too broad because it's hard to show you've influenced the field of cell biology, for example. So you have to try and narrow it down, like understanding the molecular mechanisms of protein-protein interaction or something like that. 
And then you have to define your field that if you wind up changing your job before you get the green card, the new job has to still be within the field as you define it. So I work very closely with my clients to help define the field of research. So, you know, what our firm does, I've talked about this throughout the presentation. We have the money back guarantee. We employ the team of science writers that help draft all of the letters for you. And, you know, we draft the forms and the cover letter to immigration. We use a secure file sharing service called Basecamp where you can upload all of the evidence. And, you know, I've been doing this a long time, so I have a pretty good sense of how to uh, prepare these cases for success. And again, our website is researchergreencard.com. Please feel free to visit it. You can schedule a free consultation by telephone or Skype. You can do a contact form and email, and there's also an online scheduler. I am happy to speak with you individually to go over all of the strategies that we talked about. So thank you so much. And now I'm going to send it back to Ashanti for questions. Ashanti, your, your mic is breaking up a little bit. I had a tr trouble hearing you. Um, they want to know, is the lottery uh, at a particular time of the year? Sure. So the lottery is between March 1st and March 20th of every year. So the answer is definitely yes. It's only that 20 day period where you have to submit the lottery application and you do that online at the My USCIS website. Also, have you ever had a client who, who are current grad students, like pre-PhD, who have successfully won the N1W? So with master's degrees, yes. You know, if, if you just have a master's degree and you're not getting a PhD, then, you know, we, we have successfully won NIWs in, in certain cases, depending on what they're doing. But if you're planning to get a PhD, there's really no point in applying for the green card until you graduate your PhD and start your OPT. And is travel overseas not recommended while um, the I-140 petition uh, sure. so, is pending? Yeah, the answer is it depends what your underlying non-immigrant status is. If you're in F1 or J1 status, then I, you, you should not travel overseas while the I-140 petition is pending. If you're in H-1B status, which is that dual intent status, then it's fine to travel overseas and return with a valid H-1B visa. It won't have any effect. Once you're at the 485 stage, then you can apply for an advanced parole travel document and you could travel with that. But if you're in F or J status, once you file the I-140, you shouldn't travel. And when you were talking about reviewing of articles, then, um, should it be multiple journals or can it just be one journal? Right. So, again, the more you do, the stronger your case. So, the more articles that you review for multiple journals, the, the, the stronger that presentation is to the immigration service. Because if many journals are asking you to review articles, that establishes you as an expert more than just one journal asking you. But you basically go with whatever you have. If you have one journal, then you 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 give that evidence. And how difficult or easy is it to get the O1 approved? A case, um, a prior one, a 140 filing was denied. Does this affect the approval of the O1? So the O1 is a different legal standard than EB1. With O1, you just need to meet the three categories. With EB1, you need to meet the three categories and do that second step inquiry. But if you've already had an EB1A denied, then in O1 is gonna be tough to be approved. Again, if immigration denies you once in something, it's harder to get approved the second time around. So that's why you really wanna be strategic about filing these cases. If you file the EB-1 or the O-1 too soon and it's denied, it's, you know, why are they going to approve you a second time when they denied you the first? 
it's possible, but you have to think about that. But, you know, again, if you're, if O1's the only way for you to stick because you're in a private company and you didn't win the lottery, or you want to transition, then it's probably worth trying it if you can make some kind of case. Okay, also, um, are there any exceptions being made to getting information since people can't travel back to their home country? So, yes, there are these national interest exceptions that I have been talking about. You really have to coordinate with the embassy to see whether you're going to be allowed back. So, I certainly wouldn't leave the United States at all because of COVID unless you knew that you were not going to have problems getting back. So that's really a case-by-case -case individual question that depends on the country. 100 citations good enough for a doctor from India, currently in a postdoc research position um, applying for an EB1, or is the um, NIW the safer route? Sure. So at 100 citations, the NIW is definitely the safer route, where you apply for the NIW now, you hopefully get it approved, and then in two and a half years, then you file for the EB-1, and hopefully by that time, your citation level is significantly higher, where you're going to have a reasonable chance at EB-1. 100 citations is, you know, if I had to bet, I would bet on an EB-1 denial at that level of citation. And what if a partner is following for EB-1 or NIW and the case gets accepted? Then does the other partner's case also get accepted or sure. how does that so work? There's a and difference that's between right a partner. There's the citations and everything. Yeah, so if you're legally married, then you would apply for a green card as a derivative. So you would just file the 485 based on your spouse's approved case. You wouldn't need to file your own case. Your spouse just lists you as, uh, you know, a spouse on the I-140 petition, and then you would file the 45. So if there's two spouses who are researchers, I pick the spouse with the stronger credentials and proceed with that individual's petition, with the other spouse being a backup. But a just a partner without any legal marital status doesn't confer any benefits. I think we might have lost her, so this is Fabi. Um, so your next question, if the research accomplishment news is in another language other than English, how do we use it? Sure, so you would have to just get it translated. Immigration, if it's online, I usually just do Google Translate and just give a, a printout of the uh, article. Otherwise, you would just have somebody translate it and sign a translator certification that the uh, translation is that they're fluent in both languages and the translation is true and accurate. So you just give an English translation. Okay. Um, one more about the EB1B, does it matter how important your current role is in the industry? Can you make a case for that, especially if you are someone who has last published several years back? You know, that's what's really hard. You know, when you're, when you're in EB1B, and you're in industry and you haven't published, the legal standard is showing your work is internationally recognized, recognized as outstanding. So if all of your work is proprietary to the company, you're going to have a harder time making an EB1B case. This is, I'm not saying you shouldn't try it because you can always try it, but your point is well made that when you haven't published in years, it becomes harder. And that's why I said earlier, when you go to industry, you need to think about speeding up the entire green card process. But, you know, if you already have an approved EB2 case, then you, you might as well try the EB1. Just a few more. Do you have a set number of citations um, for the EB1? There's no set number of citations for anything. Okay. Again, with EB1, you know, I like to only be thinking about it at 300 and higher. It's very hard to get it approved less than 300. 
but everybody's case and situation is unique and we sort of have to talk about it. But you know, the, 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 the higher the level of citation, the higher the chance for approval. And again, with EB1, anything can happen regardless of the level of citation. But at some point, it makes sense to file it. It usually doesn't make sense to file it under 300 citations. Uh, next question, can a non-PhD employed by a pharmaceutical company also file in the EB1 category? Yes, you know, as long as you have a, uh, so with EB1B, outstanding professors and researchers, EB1A, there's no degree requirement. The NIW has the master's degree or higher requirement, but as long as you have a permanent research position and uh, you have the, the required experience, you, you can file. Um, let's see. How difficult is it to get approved with bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees completed in the U.S., have good conference presentation, but less than 75 citations currently? Sure. So, again, you'd be talking about an NIW case, and we would sort of evaluate your big picture. How, what's your current status, and when does it expire? Where do you see your citation level growing? Is it going to, you know, is it at 40 and it's going to be at 40 for the next three years? In that case, you might as well go ahead and apply. If you think you could be at 75 in six to eight months, then you would wait. So, you know, you, you sort of have to look at the bigger picture to make that analysis. But again, the higher level of citation, the higher the chance for approval. And the last question, PhD diploma translation and, and transcripts, what exactly is needed? So you need a English translation and you give immigration the foreign language document, the English translation. And then if your degree is outside the US, you need a US degree equivalency evaluation. And there's many companies that do that. It costs about $80 to get that. Okay. That is all the questions. Thank you very much, Brian, and please reach out to Brian at theresearchergreencard.com. Thank you very much, participants, and again, thank you, Brian, for all this great information. Thank you for having me. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.